Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Today we're very pleased to have Brent Waters speaking to us on Unbounded HYBE and ABE. And Brent will be receiving a faculty fellowship today. So congratulations oh, thank to you. Brent. And um, we're very pleased to have you here. Okay, great. Th thanks, Chris. Okay, so I, I see a lot of people, I guess this is a point of convergence over the summer. So I see a lot of people I know from different places. Okay, so today I'm going to give, uh, I guess there's going to be a little more on the technical side of, uh, func of this functional encryption domain. Uh, I'm going to talk about unbounded uh, hierarchical identity-based encryption and um, attribute-based encryption. And I'll uh, discuss what I mean by unbounded soon. And this is joint work with my um, student, um, Allison. Okay, so just to put this, um, give a couple big picture slides before we start talking about the technical details. Uh, to put this in context, uh, one, you know, of course, grand notion that, that's uh, in cryptography has been the advent of public key cryptography, where if Bob wants to send a message, let's say, to um, Sarah over here, uh, he doesn't need to have an a priori shared secret um, key with um, Sarah, and instead he, what he can do is he can use her public key um, to encrypt the message for her, and then send it on over to her, and then she can use her secret key to decrypt. So uh, I'm sure everyone here is pretty familiar with this notion. However, um, along with this great advent, though, has become two ingrained notions in our head. Um, first one is that when I'm encrypting to someone, I'm usually targeting a particular receiver. That is, I'm sending to you, or I, you know, I have, have someone particular in my mind I'm sending. Um, and the second one is that decryption is an all or nothing process. That is, I either decrypt the message and learn everything about it, or I don't learn anything at all. And maybe instead we want to, um, instead we want to learn some type of function or partial view of the message, uh, depending on what our credentials are. Okay, so. Um, the problems with this are, let's imagine Bob is in a different scenario where he, he isn't saying, oh, okay, I just want to encrypt to this user Sarah anymore. Um, what, he, what he wants to do is he's thinking of sharing information, let's say, in the LAPD with everyone who's in internal affairs um, or who's an undercover officer in the central division. Now, when he's thinking of inf sharing information this way, he runs into a few problems. Um, first of all, um, how does he figure out everyone who matches this? Like, how does he, like, he has to have some process for enumerating one. Um, also, is he even allowed to know everyone that matches this? Like, maybe it's not a good idea to be able to enumerate all undercover officers. Um, you know, might sort of defeat the attribute. Uh, second, what, what if someone um, joins the system later? I, you know, I want to encrypt everyone who, you know, who has and, and will match this profile, but I, I don't know what the future ho holds. Like, I don't know who's going to, you know, be here in the summer, next summer at uh, Microsoft. Um, and um, what, instead, if we want to have a process view of the data. So instead of like in the past, what we had to usually do was how to um, transform, you, you know, like somehow engineer our, our, our way between how we think of data and this mechanism for public key encryption, which could be a messy thing and there might not be solutions in, um, in all these cases. And so what the vision of functional encryption does is um, instead of trying to just bridge this gap with engineering, I want to be able to, when I think of sharing information a certain way, I want to be able to um, express this or embed this in the encryption system itself. Okay? So th this, this is going to, like, I decided to throw these couple, um, I kind of borrowed some of Allison's slides and decided to throw in these things to try to give um, maybe the big picture of what we're um, looking at that will hopefully, um, you know, mo motivate some of the things we're working on. Okay, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about two specific um, primitives within this. So this, this um, functional encryption idea is this big umbrella and, uh, you know, can cover a lot of different things. And here what I'm going to really do is talk about, like, um, two, two particular problems, that have, like two particular uh, specific things, um, attribute-based encryption and HIB. So let's take a look at hierarchical identity-based encryption. Um, just to get a sense, how many people have, are familiar with this? Most, most people in the room? Okay. Um, okay, so the idea of, uh, uh, most, and most people are familiar with identity-based encryption? I, I, I mean, I, I assume it's a suit. Su okay, so, um, so identity-based encryption is where when I want to encrypt the message, I don't need to look up, I can just describe it. You know, I had this, I can just describe it with your name or your identity. Um, hierarchical identity-based encryption is, uh, can be thought of somewhat as a generalization of this where um, the name is more like a vector 
of, uh, of names. Like, uh, for example, you might think of a hierarchy like on the internet, um, edu, dot, um, utexas, so I, I guess it's the opposite direction, the way the internet puts it. It's edu, colon, utexas, colon, cs, colon, b, waters. And the, identity, uh, the idea of hierarchical IBE is, let's say, some user, there could be some master authority who generates these keys way up there that's not even in the picture, and let's say there's some user like Alice here who has the dot edu one, and, she, and what she could do is, well, she can use it to decrypt things to edu, but she can also um, create keys um, further on down the line. Maybe Stanford's over here, and Texas is id2 prime, and then we can go on down to CS and, and, and delegate on down um, further. Um, hopefully the benefit being that, like, you know, um, it's easier for, uh, let's say, this guy to know which departments um, University of Texas has as opposed to someone um, way up higher on the chain. Okay, so since most of the, um, so it's, it's good that uh, this would be kind of a brief inter introduction here. Okay, so Alice can have a key, and she can autonomously create these um, private keys. She doesn't need to go back up to the authority. Okay, so um, let me just um, briefly go through HIB, and anyone should stop me if they're um, not, you know, if, uh, I'm going to go through this a little quickly since I assume there's some familiarity with it, but um, please stop me if uh, there's a point of confu confusion here. Okay, so there's going to be a setup algorithm. Uh, where this, uh, let's say, authority will generate the public parameters and also generate a master secret key pair. All right, uh, okay, then there's going to be an encryption algorithm where I'm going to want to encrypt the message M, use these public parameters, and describe how I'm encrypting it by this vector of identities. So let's say I'm encrypting, uh, I'll just keep on using the same example. Um, I'm encrypting again to like EDU, um, CS, uh, I always do it backwards, EDU, Texas, CS, um, B waters. Okay? And, um, um, and then there's a key generation process, which the master authority generates a private key for um, perhaps a different identity vector, i. So uh, again, one of these hierarchical ones. And it'll like, create the secret key for this. And then finally, there's, um, so that's to get it from the master authority. But also, if, I, if I'm somewhere on this chain, like um, let's say in Kristen's group, she might want to um, delegate on down. Um, she'll execute this algorithm, which she can take her secret key and create one um, sort of lower on the hierarchy. Um, below that. Okay? And then finally, there's going to be a decryption algorithm where if I have a private key, um, so let's say if, um, if a ciphertext was encrypted for an identity vector, um, let's call it x, and I have a private key for identity vector y, if y is a prefix of x, I can decrypt. Um, mm -hmm. So keygen and delegation generate the same type of key or the same looking key that we've been uh, let's assume they do for, 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 for now. Um, you, 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 could, you could have systems where you couldn't differentiate between them, but um, uh, let's, just, let's just assume we, we kind of, let, let's just assume we require that they have the same distribution. Um, fair enough, I mean, yeah. Okay, but yeah, the, in, in practice, actually, you can, get, you can actually gain some efficiency in practice by relaxing this a little bit. Um, but yeah, let, let's assume that's the case. Okay, and one of the goals with, um, um, with uh, hierarchical identity-based encryption is that you get this flexibility. Um, first of all, new users can enter at any level, and you can sort of get your key from the immediate supervisor. Let's say if um, Kristen hires so someone, um, which apparently she has done for the summer, uh, you know, we, we, she does need to like, call up uh, Bill Gates or Steve Ballmer or something, and not that that would literally happen, but uh, you know, she, she, uh, she, you know, she can autonomously make decisions. Like you know, She has this local view within her group, and you know, it's probably the case that like, um, you know, like the people way up at Microsoft, I'm sure they do care about you, but they, they probably don't, right? <laughs> they, they, you know, they, they probably don't. They, they care about you, but they probably aren't knowledgeable about you. And um, it's much better if she can make these um, local decisions. And we can encrypt to any ID string, okay? And, and it's, it's even less likely that someone at the .com domain um, knows about your um, you know, summer employment. Okay, so, um, so in HIB uh, systems, uh, or, or sorry, uh, what we have is we can have an exponential size identity sort of um, horizontally. And what I mean by this is that um, at each level, the string can be of any length. I mean, just using collision-resistant hash functions. We, we can make the string um, of, uh, <coughs> of, of any length. Um, but one question I'm going to ask here is, uh, using current system, what about vertical growth? Like, how, how many levels... Um, how many levels do I want to be able to um, um, go down? And um, so what we have is we've, so let's say, what we've had in previous systems is that we always had to, when we set up the system, we had to set up the depth. 
um, of the hierarchy. Like, you know, when we published the public parameters, we had to say, well, this is going to go to depth seven. This is going to go to depth um, three. Um, we had to kind of pick something ahead of time. And the reason we don't just pick, like, oh, depth 10 billion or something is that the uh, um, size of the parameters uh, tends to scale linearly with, with the depth. And so we kind of end up in this kind of funny situation where you have to take this guess ahead of time. And if, you, you know, if you're overly conservative, you, you might pay a lot in terms of performance. And, and however, if, if you're, if you're, um, if, if you, but if you want to really, you know, you want to keep things small, keep things compact, um, it might turn out that someone needs to go down to a certain depth, and uh, you cut them off earlier, and that could be a problem. Uh, we'll see towards the end of the talk, like, um, well, in, in HIB, somebody can say, well, maybe like 20 is good enough for all applications, but in attribute-based encryption, um, this, this is sort of a pedagogical. We'll, we'll spend most of the time technical time on HIB, but in attribute-based encryption, I think this scenario becomes more motivating, where Instead of bounding like a depth, you're bounding the number of attributes you can use. And that, that, that's probably, um, so I'll, I'll just remark, even though I'm going to talk about HIB, I'll kind of remark that you know, perhaps the stronger motivation comes from um, the attribute-based encryption. Uh, for those of you who have heard of it, I'll, I'll, I'll talk. But I'll, so, so we will kind of learn, but the main technical things we can learn in the HIB world, it's a little simpler, so I'm going to focus, um, focus on that. Um, but just kind of keep in mind, this is where we eventually go to. OK. so. So before in previous systems, we, we always had to have this bound of the depth for two different reasons. Um, the first one, uh, we, what, which, which we used to have, was um, security degradation, um, where, the, um, where we used to have these partitioning proofs for security. And for depth of security, uh, we just had an exponential loss in the depth of the hierarchy. How many people, like, I don't mean to make this into a quiz or anything, how many people have kind of heard of, heard of this problem or kind of? Maybe, okay, so, so like, you know, if I want to go to depth D, um, uh, I usually had like, uh, if, if there were Q queries, you said I get to use the whiteboard, right? Yeah. Um, so later I'm going to want to just move it. Is, is that a doable thing? So if we had like Q queries, and we had, a, let's say, depth, um, let's say D was our depth, this, the security loss in all these reductions was like, you, had, you lost this Q to the D factor. Um, so, so, you know, if you went to depth six, uh, <laughs> so this is exponential uh, in, in the depth D. So um, th th this was not su such, a, um, such a good thing. Uh, but actually, it, it, did, it did turn out that um, th there were techniques, um, first by um, Craig Gentry and um, Shai Halevi using one thing, and then my, myself using something called uh, dual system encryption that actually got around this problem. Um, so we just ended up with one over Q, and uh, you know, we didn't need to worry about this depth D factor. Okay, but even with this, what were the queries for? Um, pri private key queries. So, so an attacker can make queries to key gen and to delegate, um, to, key, to key gen and to delegate. Um, so you know, if, if you made, yeah. Um, so so, so but this was for adaptive security, by the way. If we, if we kind of made this sort of false assumption that adversary tells you which thing he's taken ahead of time, it's tight, but tight for a kind of false reason. Um, but both, uh, like the, yeah, if, if, if you, and it wasn't just, so I have, this is the first one, but then Alice and I had some other ones along these lines. Uh, th there are change, I mean, there are different systems, technically, although they clearly have inspiration from, it wasn't like we just wiped the board clean. Um, but yeah, we needed to change the system, too. Um, yeah, I can talk about that offline. It's kind of, uh, it, it's kind of, like, it's sort of, it, it's almost like the same system. You can prove it's secure in two different ways, but not quite the same. Um, okay, but even if we believe the selective model, and, and now that we do have these proofs, we have another problem, which is that the parameter size, um, like I was saying earlier, does dictate how far we can go down. And we're kind of, if you think you're trying to export an AP, let, let's pretend, you know, we're cryptographers, um, but we're trying to export this API to some systems person. Um, they have to sort of make this operate, they have to make this guess about how, how, you know, how big your system is going to be, how deep it's going to be, or in the case of AB, how many attributes you're going to use. And it'd be better not to force them to make this guess, right? Because, you know, they, they have this trade-off, and, you know, if they try, if they want to help performance, they're going to have to go one way. And um, however, if they go too far, you know, the system won't work. So in all pretty much in all previous constructions, I should say in the standard model, with random oracles, you can play a few tri tricks. Um, like it, uh, you know, it, it had these, it had these um, lim limitations. 
And also there's this lattice stuff. And so the lattice stuff you know, had some neat innovations, but really it, it follows kind of the high level combinatorial stuff. Like you have all this fancy lattice stuff going around, but at the combinatorial level it, it's really the same as the old pairing based constructions. Um, and, and so it has the same um, limitations. Okay, so I want to do something a little experimental. It's okay, I, I'm under control. Uh, <laughs> and I want to, uh, can, how do we raise the board? There's presumably a, a button. Uh-oh, did I just? Um, so, this is this so revolutionary? We don't know how to, oh boy. Okay, so I might ask you to lower it again, Josh. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's a whole new button, and, and it's okay. So we'll uh, we'll actually see how this. Um, I'm gonna try something a little experimental here, and uh, oh boy, um, and, and we we can see if it was a good idea at the end of, at the, end of the day. Okay, but I get my award no matter whether it works out or not. <laughs> so, okay, so so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, I'm going to uh, write down the Bonnet boring system, and we're going to just kind of work out s some things on the whiteboard. And so I want to start with the Bonnet boring identity based encryption system. And I'm going to show you some. So, first, we're going to kind of work it out. I'm going to show you some possible improvement I have for it, and then we, we can kind of um, see how it works. Okay, so it's good to prepare for these things, which you sort of did. So, it's going to be a. So, we're doing I I IBE right now. Is that that's okay? Right? Um, so, not HIB for a second. Um, how many people? Well, I won't pull you anymore. So, so how many, well, I will. Um, how many people have seen the Bonnet and Boyne system? Like, okay, quite a few. Okay, so let's say I'm encrypt. So there's going to be setup. Um, I'll be a little loose with notation, in which we pick um, these elements in the bilinear group um, u, g, u, and h. Uh, oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to assume no, no in bilinear maps. Uh, I won't get my whole interest. So. Uh, and there's going to be e of g, g to the alpha, where this is the public parameters, and the master secret key will be alpha. Let's say, I could think of it as g to the alpha. So, um, and, and also the master secret key has the public parameters too, right? Okay. So, um, okay. So what's the next algorithm we want? We want an encryption algorithm, right? We want to be able to encrypt. Um, M, given the um, public parameters and an ID. Okay. And I'm also going to define this one function here of the pub. So I'm going to define f of ID is equal to anyone, or let's call it h of ID. Does anyone rem remember this? What's the Bonny Boyne hash function? G1 ID. Yeah, so actually I'm going to use u in this case. Yeah. Um, so, uh, okay. So to encrypt, I choose, um, I'm going to choose a random S. And choose exponent S. And I'm going to have M times E of G, G to the alpha S. This is going to be my ciphertext. Or uh, I was going to. Call it H of ID for a second. Um, okay. Any questions here? I just choose a random exponent s. I take the message m blind. I take e of g g to the alpha, raise it to the s to get this blinding factor. So I blind my message by this. Take g. I can raise it to the s, and I can compute this function H of ID, and I can raise that to the s. Okay. So, so we agree it's computable. Um, okay. Uh, now what I want is I want um, a key gen. Key gen function of master secret key and ID. Okay, here, here I'm going to choose. So, um, so G is of order prime order P. Okay. Um, please stop me if there's any um, confusion on on this. And let's see here. Marker. Okay, so we have. G to the alpha uh, times H of, let's call this ID tilde or something, right? Maybe it's different. Um, to the S, no, no, um, to the R. Uh, 
Um, yeah, and that should work. Okay, so, so, so this, is, this is how we encrypt. This is how we generate a private key. And now for decryption, pretty much we just pair this part. So, so really for decryption, okay, we're talking about getting the message M, but we really want, once you get this, you, you divide it out and get the message M, right? So we're really trying to recover this. So we just pair this with this and that with that. And, um, and we end up getting, we, we end up getting um, this part over here. Uh, so I, I can, so if we do the pair, so let me just kind of draw, so I'm just drawing decryption now, uh, which is E of H of ID, comma G, the RS. So here when we pair this, we actually get what we want. We get E of G to the alpha S from, from, from this thing over here. So we get what we want, but we also get this extra junk over here. So we get hash of, so, I'm a, so, so if, I, if, I, if we get hash of identity um, to the RS. However, if this I is equal to, wait a second. Yeah, I lost a term, so we get E of hash of I. Okay, and if I is equal to, if this ID from the ciphertext is equal to this ID from the private key, um, we can just divide this out of here and get what we need. Okay. Um, so any, any questions on this? Any brief? Okay, so this is, this is the Boney Boyne system, and um, I, made this, I made this identity um, function here a little abstract, but if we plug in their, um, however, if we plug in their, uh, Hash, let's just kind of plug it in to make it a little bit more concrete. Um, so this will be uh, u to the id h to the s. Okay. So, and, and then we'll, we'll do the similar thing over, over here, right? Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to propose a, um, an improve, like, I want to shave down the parameter. I think we maybe shave down the parameters just a little bit in the bonet boyne system. So I want to propose an improvement and then see how that goes. Okay? So what? Sorry, yeah? I need a reminder here. So it's okay if my ID is like one more than your ID and our hash is different by factor of you. And bad things don't happen. Um, in, in this hash function? Yeah. Yes. So there's no, okay. There's no attack. Um, okay, but, but let, let's take a look at my improvement. So okay. let's see how it goes. Um, so, so, um, so, so suppose, uh, okay, so, so what I want to do now is I want to shave off a little bit since this looks a little extraneous. So here's, here's my new hash function. Okay. Now, so, so maybe this is the starting point to the talk I'm going to have here. Um, so any, so, so what do people, th and of course you'll just make the same change to the hash function down there, right? So what, what do people think about this? It's insecure. Why? Okay, so, um, so what I'm Ken saying is that suppose, yeah, suppose I have an encryption for ID and I want to change it into one for ID prime under, under the same message. So maybe I have the private key for ID prime but I don't have it for ID. So, so how, how can I do this? What, what do I do? Yeah, so, so I, I raised this whole thing over here to ID prime over, um, over ID, right? So I have the one over ID part here, which, which cancels this out, and then we raise it. So it's this, mal this is malleability attack, right? And so you're kind of <laughs> with the... Uh, yeah, one of these. Oh, okay, so, um, so I, I, I get this. So I shouldn't be able to take a ciphertext for message M for a certain ID and just change it to a ciphertext for another ID of, of what I'm saying. Um, and this maybe relates to your question a little bit. Like, um, like yeah, it's, 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 it's bad to be able to do that. And apparently with my new improvement, um, I, I think it's pretty much the same. You know, you could try to go to I. And actually it could be any, I think. Okay, well, so this is, you know, maybe the way of looking at it in the system, but I think there's like um, a different view uh, that, that like, well, we can take sort of a linear algebra view of, of what happened in this attack. So the earlier system we believed was secure, or at least, um, you know, assuming that there, there's not a break in the <laughs> paper that's been out there for, for seven years. And if we think about what's going on in the ciphertext, what's really happening over here, so we, back when we had, back when we had the H in there, 
we can kind of write what's happening in the exponent as a, a vector. So it's like the scalar s, which is hidden, times, uh, so it was, let's see, id. So, so this is the u component. So I'm writing this, this is like the u component here. And the h component was 1. OK? And if I wanted to change it to, and I get one sample of this, right? From, from the ciphertext, I get one, one sample of this. So if I want to do an attack, I pretty much have to change this to um, id prime. So what I have here is I, I get one vector from a dimensional 2 space. So this, this is a dimensional 2, two space, right? Um, and there's no, there's no scalar, uh, there's no scalar, or, or at least it, there's no scalar, let's say, symbolically, that I can multiply this, this vector by to get this vector. Is that, I mean, ignore the s even. Like, um, there's, there's no scale I can multiply, um, assuming id is not equal to id prime. Right? So, so, so this is kind of a simple thing. So when I, when I did this, when I did this um, so-called um, improvement over here, um, well, I kind of, uh, so here's my, here's my improvement. And uh, what I did was I, I kind of got rid of this dimension. And then I gave you, that now we had a one-dimensional vector space, which I gave you one vector from. And uh, I'm not very good at linear algebra, but uh, <laughs> you know, it, it means you can span the, the, whole, the whole space. Um, our mathematicians can confirm, confirm this. Yes. Uh, OK, so, so you see the problem was here was that I gave out, I, 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 in some sense, I, had, I wanted to have, give out n things, and that mean, meant I had to have n plus 1, at least n plus 1 dimension subspace. OK. Now, um, any questions on this? Is this, this so we can kind of see this, this problem in, in, in just the IB context if I wanted to shave things down a little bit further. OK, so now, um, is this OK for me to do this little whiteboard? Yeah, I thought it's something a little different, right? Um, so now let's look at HIB, okay? And so the HIB system, yeah? Uh, in the selective security model, it was under um, decisional um, BDH. Although right now I'm just looking at trying to break things. Yeah. Yeah, it's decisional bilinear Diffie-Hellman assumption, which it in selective. Okay, so now what we can do is, um, so if we want to, let's say, do a hierarchical IB, let's say a depth two, um, really the Boney, the, so the Boney system was actually a hierarchical IBE scheme. And so instead of having one hash function, so for the first level we had one hash function, for the second level we had a different one. And so we might get something like um, hash of, yeah, it's gonna be a little messy here. Uh, how, how does that go? Okay, so we might get like hash of, let's call this R1, hash of ID 1 to the S, and this is hash of ID 1 colon ID 2 to the S. Now let's say, I, and then if I want to delegate on, oh shoot, okay, let, let's get this out of the way. Um, now let's say if let's say I had ID I'll just make it a little simpler here. Let's say I had ID one over here and I want to delegate on down to, to ID two. I just pick a new R two, so I have oh sorry, hash one, hash two. So hash two of ID one colon ID two. So so I'm kind of I'm I'm doing delegation dynamically on the board. Um, okay, so I just pick a new R two myself. So, so so this is Kristen delegating to a group. She picks a new she picks a new R two and then has g to the r2 over here, okay? And to decrypt, we again just kind of do these pairings, like we get this e of g, g to the alpha s, and then we have two things we need to cancel out here, so the cancellations will come from these two parts. Um, I won't, won't draw this. <coughs> okay, now, so I want to ask a question. Since, since um, my first improvement um, didn't go too well, I'm going to... You have a question? I was asking a question. <laughs> uh, okay, well, what's your question? Is it possible to have two types of keys where one type of key only allows the decryption, whereas the other can only be used for delegation? Of course, if you can delegate, then you can decrypt as well. But not every decryption key can be used for delegating. Yeah, I think you could do this in a generic way. Like, 
Like, so, so you're saying, what if Kristen's the manager of the group and I don't want her to be able to delegate on down anymore? Yeah, um, sorry, I don't mean to bring you into every, every example. Um, yeah, because I could just go, go to her level and then like have this null, 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 like kind of give her nulls all the way down. Have a null ID, you only need one null ID. You know, the leftmost leaf cannot be expanded by semantic. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so you could do it in kind of a, you can do it in a generic fashion, I think, is the short answer. Although, um, yeah, so I, I, I kind of do delegate, when I give her the key, I just kind of delegate her all the, let's assume there's a bottom. Which uh, uh, I guess doesn't happen in the unbounded case, but um, uh, assume there is a bottom, I could just kind of bring her all the way down. Why don't I punt a little bit on that one um, for, for now, since it's kind of a little tangent, tangential. Okay, so now I want to have another improvement, which I thought. Of. So I'm going to try to still do this with two parameters, and and, and here here's going to be my um, um, here's going to be my hash functions. Uh, so let's let's see if it let's see how these work. So I'm going to actually replace these with something concrete. So now, so, so you see, now I'm trying to do, so before two, two parameters work for HIB of level, well, sorry, IB of just, you know, one level, just IB. And now I'm trying to do it with two parameters for, um, so now I'm trying to do it for uh, uh, level two and, and two parameters. Okay, so, uh, two public parameters. So, so what I'm trying to do now, let's see, um, so maybe here I have, okay. We'll save that until it actually works. Um, okay, so uh, h to the one over id. Okay, this would be raised to the s. So this is for level one. This is my, um, and then this will be u to the id squared times h raised to the s. Okay. Now the question is, what? Oh, so, sorry. So, so this is id one, and this is id two, or I, id two concatenated, whatever it is. Um, so I'm going to take u to the id 1 qubit and h to the 1 over id. Over the whole concatenation of ids? Um, and, well, well, and then the concatenation happens over here. So 1 over id, is that id 1 or id 2? This is id 1 too. Awesome. ID one. So that formula only has id 1s? Yeah, it only has id 1. And the, one, the other one has? Uh, yeah, let's say this, this, okay, so I'll I'm just kind of right now I'm BS, so I'm not like, like there's, there's going to be some generic. So ID1, I shouldn't say, ID, okay, ID1 concatenate with ID2 squared. Got it, okay. Yeah. So can this possibly work? Pretty comp. Well, so I have some complicated looking stuff up here, right? But let's kind of look at the two things. Let's look at it in the linear algebra thing, right? Um, so here I have this vector at this vector s. So I raise u to the id cubed, and then I have this as one over id here. Id one. Okay, Leo's gonna make me be precise. And then I have another vector, which is s to um, whatever uh, id one concatenate with id two squared, comma one. Oh, okay. Um, well, let, let me see if I can make my point. Like, uh, okay, I'll, okay. So let's don't study this too hard. Is, is one hint. Um, so, so how, 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 what's the dimension of the space here? Two. How, how many vectors did I give you? Two. So, what can I do? I, I can I can span I can span the whole space again, right? Like, if you know, name me any s to the name me any a b. And I can take some linear combinations of these and, and, and give you this for, for A and B, right? So, I mean, I don't know if people figure, like this whole cubing in one over, I, I just kind of made this up. I, I didn't actually th think about this. I mean, we raised it to the fifth or something. I, I don't know. Okay, so, so don't, so that, that's what I'm saying. Don't, don't, don't let's, let's not uh, worry about exact. So the, the, the point here is that we have, um, we give away sort of two vectors and our, and our subspace is dimension two, then we can span it. So, so I can maul it to anything I want. Like give me any, so, so compute it for a different ID, compute it for, like compute any ID or, or two level ID of your choice with, um, you know, compute the hash functions, compute what they're supposed to be, compute the A part, compute the B part, and um, you can use what's already there to, to, to calculate it. Okay, so that, 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 that's the point. The point isn't like, I, I just made up this cubing and raising to the fifth thing or whatever. 
Okay. Um, so so don't yeah don't 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 study don't study it too hard. Okay. So so this this is um, so this is the problem. The problem is is that in general, like with these previous systems, uh, the, so the whole point of this exercise with these previous systems, um, if I had if I wanted to have um, sort of n instances, if I want to have n levels, I needed to have n plus one size parameters. Okay, and, and some analog of this would be true in the attribute-based encryption world. And this isn't, um, and this isn't such a good thing. Be, and kind of the reason for this is that this global, like I'm getting all these vectors, but they're all raised to the same s. They're not like individually randomized each time. But there's a reason for this. I mean, the reason I raise them to the same s is so that decryption works, right? Because I need to, I, I pair this with s over here, and I, you know, need everything. To, I can't just, I need decryption to work. I mean, having a non-functioning system is not a, a good option. Um, so I can't just, you know, make up random, you just make up stuff um, over here. Okay, so um, does this give some, so it maybe gives you some intuition about why this problem, and, and this isn't just for Bone Boing, like all these other systems that have appeared so far, um, kind of, you know, basically fall in this category, kind, kind of fall, fall in this uh, um, type. So Josh, we have a big task for you. Uh, and, and oh, oh, sorry, sorry, well, you, you have the experience, so. Yeah. Okay. So, any well, any questions before it goes down? Yeah. Okay. Too, too late. Okay. And th and this is kind of what these two two sides said. So well, that, that so that was my little experimentation with giving a talk partially on the whiteboard. Okay. So so these two slides uh, basically said um, what I'm talking about here. <coughs> it's uh, contagious, I guess. Uh, so our approach um, is to use um, some type of, I want to do a secret sharing plus fresh randomness for each level. Uh, okay, so. Before you go there, is this going to trade large public parameters for larger ciphertext? No. Okay. That's all right, maybe I'll come yeah. there's, there's other bad things it doesn't do. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so, so no, we, we will, okay, oh, sorry, the ciphertext will get a little larger, but not like, maybe like a factor of two larger. Um, although there's some better way to make it, like a factor of 1.5. Okay, so but it won't like blow it up like n cubed or, or something bad like that. Um, okay, so our goal is going to be be able to do an unbounded system. I, I like I want to have a uh, constant number of public parameters, hopefully a small constant like you know three, four, five, something like that um, of group elements, and be able to go anywhere I want with this um, with, with this uh, uh, with this HIB scheme. Okay, so, so what we kind of do is, uh, so let me, this will be kind of a high level picture, then maybe looking at the actual construction will help a little bit more. So there'll be this kind of master secret, which was g to the alpha um, for this alpha back here. And for each kind of level or component, we're going to split this up in, in, into many different um, pieces that you know, should go well together. But then we're going to kind of random, we're going to randomize each piece of your key, you know, of someone's key. So let's not worry about the delegation for a second. Um, so, so that they, they need to sort of be unrandomized in order to tie them back together. And um, then what we're going to do is that for the ciphertext will be for a vector id prime. And when each level, well, this wasn't the best notation, i sub i. Um, at each level, what we're going to do is um, kind of pair them together. And if, if, you know, if, these, if these things uh, match up right, it'll sort of um, paint this brush over it. And then, we'll, and then after. You know, after the pairing or the decryption, we'll be able to put them back together. Okay, so well, let's let's just look at the system, and hopefully that'll clear things up a little bit. Okay, so public parameters in the system. Um, uh, the actual description in the paper is going to be in um, like some composite order group, mainly for the reason of the proof. But I'm just going to give it to you the prime order version to to make it a little simpler, so we don't have all these things flying around. Okay, so we're going to have uh, f you know five group elements, four in the bilinear chart. Sorry, four in the bilinear group, one in the target group. So, so um, this is a small um, constant. Um, we can agree. And the master secret key will be um, al some exponent um, alpha. OK, so now let's look at how decryption works. And so let's say we're encrypting to a vector of length j. Like I'm going j levels deep in my, so I should, OK, I should be able to go to any depth I want. right? There's, there's, there's no bound. This is the point of it being unbounded. Um, so I pick um, this S, which is this global S, analogous to what we saw earlier. 
but also this randomness for each different level, which we, we didn't see earlier. And now, um, unfortunately, there's a slightly simpler version of this scheme. I, I wish I had time to. So this is the version from the paper. Um, so we take our message m, blend it by e of g, g to the alpha s. We kind of saw that before. We have this g to the s part. But now what we do is for each different level, from le for, for level 1, 2, all the way to j, we, we, sort of, we have this w to the s term, which is this global thing. But this, um, the main point to get across here is that we have this individual randomness on each level. And it, um, at some level, it prevents us, since there's this ti, notice this t sub i is present everywhere. This, this attack, which we had before, of just doing linear combinations of things on each level w w won't, won't happen. Or, or we, we hope it won't happen, I should say. Okay, so, so there is something else going on here. Um, so this t sub i is intuitively stopping us from doing these linear combinations, or, or at least we hope so. Um, but we have to also hope that um, decryption works, that, that it's correct. Right? Um, easy to make a broken system. Um, OK, so our key gen, we have this. So here's the master authority doing the key gen, has this random out. Pick, uh, sorry, has this alpha, which is from the master secret key, and splits it up into j, j. So assume the levels are the same. So it splits them to lambda 1 through lambda j, such that the sum of all of them is equal to alpha. Okay, so this is this um, secret splitting. And also chooses ran, some two random, um, two variables randomly for each level. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to like f focus on kind of the part. Oh, OK, and then what we have is for each level, uh, so kind of each level will have a piece of alpha. And, and you know, if we have all these pieces, we, we can um, literally combine to get alpha. And then there's something dependent upon the identity at each level. OK. And but an interesting thing here, even though we kind of said, well, the bone and boy thing doesn't work for this, um, there's kind of remnants. It's almost like we kind of do the scheme locally. We kind of almost put, put, push it back a little bit further. Like, like there, this does look like the bone boyne HIB scheme. At each different level, we almost, you can imagine like instead of T of I, so before we had this global variable S, and now we're almost doing this HIB thing um, locally at each um, level. So, um, <coughs> okay, let me, so this is just what I talked about um, before, but let's kind of look at how things might work for, for, for decryption. Okay, so we, if we have M, E of GG to the alpha S, so we're wanting to get E of GG to the alpha S. So um, one way to get e of gg to the alpha s is if we just recover e of gg to the lambda i times s for, for, each, for each i. Because then, then when we um, multiply all these together, all the lambdas sum together, which sums to alpha. So we're gonna, this is going to be our, sub, our subtask over here. <coughs> OK, so, so one way towards getting to it is that, um, so I'm just showing you a piece of, I'm not showing you all the ciphertext and key, is if we, um, Pair this together, and then pair this together, and then divide them out. Um, so this component paired with this component will cancel out here. So, so, so this will give you E of GW to the S times YI. And um, so what we're left with is something that gives us what we want over here, and something else that we need to cancel. So, so we, need, we get what we want over here, um, and then we need to cancel. But in order to recover it, we need to cancel out this part. OK, so this is some local thing. And now this, this, this part over here is actually canceled out in the similar to the Boney Boyne like way or, or Kennedy Halevi Katz like way um, with this local thing. OK, so, here, here, here's, gonna, so here's like a little more detailed. Um, pretty much what we're going to see is that the theme of this is that we'll get, what we want, we'll get something we want, but it's going to be multiplied by something that we don't want and we want to get rid of. And then we're going to want to get that thing to get rid of it. But then when we go for that, we're going to. Um, Get it, but then get another thing. It's going to be this kind of long, this kind of long chain of things, um, but but you know it, it will terminate, which is good. Okay, so so our first goal is to recover e g to the alpha s, right? Because we want this to get the message. Okay, so we and then we can do this. We can get a new sub goal of recovering each of these e of g to, to the lambda i times s. Um, please please ask me a question if there's like any point here. Okay. So we can do this by, by pairing these two things together. So we get the s and the lambda i part here, but then we get this extra junk. Um, so we get the part we want, and then we get this extra junk. So now I have a new, new goal, right? I want to get this thing over here. OK, and then, um, OK, but then we, we can get it by pairing this with this. Um, 
But again, we, so we kind of get this thing that we need over here, but now we got um, that thing. And so, so I'm sorry that this chain is, is a little long here. But then at the, finally at the end, um, we, we can actually get this part with all these cancellations. Um, I should mention that there's a slightly simpler version. So I must wish I was able to write up this. A slightly simpler version of this scheme, which, um, <clears throat> which, which has one less, one less thing in the chain. It's a little bit easier to understand. I, I can show some people, to, people um, on paper afterwards if you're interested. Um, but yeah, we, it's sort of the, the proof for this one worked out a little bit better. Um, so like, um, OK, I just want to mention that key, key, key delegation is pretty, like um, we want to be able to do delegation. That's pretty easy. So before, we had it at J levels. And now we want to go to J plus 1 level. Um, so you just pick this um, omega 1 through omega J plus 1 that sum to 0. And you kind of re-randomize the key. So you kind of tag on this extra part to the key, and then you, you re-randomize it. Um, so this isn't too much different. I mean, it's accommodated for the system, but it's not too much di novel compared to what was done before. Um, OK. And then you have to also re- So you have to re-randomize. So, so there was this, who asked this question earlier if the keys were distributed the same? That was you, Brian? OK, so, so in this system, we, we do distribute the keys the same in both ways. Um, you can probably improve the efficiency a little bit of delegation by not doing it that way. Um, but then your proof becomes harder. Um, <clears throat> OK, uh, so how are we doing on time, Kristen? Like, uh, should well, I? Okay, I don't want to torture people that long. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so. The typical talk is an hour. So okay. If you want so I'll wrap it up in. Yeah. Okay. That that that'll, that'll be fine. Um, okay. So what I want. Okay. So. Oh, I'm Ken. Um, it, it's for composite order, but I, I presented you the prime order thing. Um, you, you you could do prime order in the generic group model or some not so awesome thing. Um. And I think someone else, not, not me, is actually converted. So most of these composite order group things, the point is to get these subspaces for the, and you can translate it to prime order groups. Um, but I'll, 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 maybe I'll take. Okay, so so this this is the system. So um, and, uh, for, so before I go on to just discuss like at a high level of proof, any questions on the system? So kind of the challenge is that you want this, you you want this global variable in the ciphertext to tie everything together. You know, it has to decrypt at the end of the day. But we, we saw the spanning problem with the vectors. So the technical challenge was how do we kind of randomize each level, but still let things come. So we don't want things to combine in the bad way. This is how a lot of this crypto goes. We want things to combine in the way we don't want, where we're changing all these vectors. But, but, we, do want things, but we do want things to decrypt at the end. So kind of the, the, the trick was to get this um, kind of randomize each, each level locally, but still in a way that allows you to combine at the end. Matt? So there, there are some. Policy AB schemes, I think, including yours, where you're going to alter the keys, essentially reshare the secret to make policies that are more restrictive. Yeah. Is that, I mean, that seems very similar to this. Are there fundamental differences? Um, this is a, HIB is a subset of AB with delegation. Are the techniques, aside from the security group, are the techniques very similar to that? Do they kind of come right out of that? or? Um, yeah, the techniques are, well, I'll briefly discuss the AB thing. Yeah, the techniques are. Are similar in some ways. The HIB is just kind of pedagogically easier to do um, to talk about right now. But um, yeah, I think AB with delegation is more powerful. Okay, so I'm just gonna. Um, so this one. So I'll go. Yeah. So the hardness assumption for this is some of these composite order group assumptions. But I will mention that people have been able to take all these systems building these assumptions. People have in the past found analogs in the linear assumption. And someone, I, I, it's not me, but someone else has already done this. So, so, so th this is with some, some of these subgroup, like maybe th through these subgroup type assumptions. But um, I, I, I don't know, like, I kind of know this privately, so I'm not sure how much I could share, but, but someone else has done this in the linear assumption. So. Well, independent of the difference between composite and prime order groups, like, I mean, you threw up a lot of terms there, so it looked like maybe it would be like some. Q, SDH thing or something? Oh, it's, there's, no, there's no Q. There's, there's so no it's Q. it's just, um, yeah. it's, if your proof were in the prime order group, it would be DLIN? Yeah, yeah, if, yeah, in the prime order group, there is a prime, it's not that exact system I showed you, but there's kind of a ver version of it someone else has under DLIN. And um, f f for the, in my paper, it's not Q anything. It's a couple, it's like three assumptions in composite order groups, but they're static assumptions. They don't have this, they don't depend on Q. 
Oh, I stopped giving them names. So <laughs> they, 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 they fall within some class, different subgroup type assumptions. I, I can show you offline a little bit if you're interested, but um, there's probably no efficient way to communicate them right now. Um, but uh, kind of the point is, I think, I think people, well, OK, so now that, now that you, now, now I'm on this, um, in some sense, I see, I, I see this, this stuff happening in, in, in two, there's kind of two different ways to do these things. If you do them with composite order groups, you can usually really get them without a Q-type assumption, but then the actual assumption looks a little messy. And some people go, oh my gosh, it's, it's kind of confusing, it's messy. But then there's the second phase, which is translate, you know, well, why did I do it with composite order groups? Well, because I needed these subspaces, and it's cleaner and easier to do with subgroups. And, and then you can kind of, so this is kind of where you can develop the main concepts. This is my own view of things. And, and then there's this kind of mechanical part where you can take these concepts and then translate them to prime order groups and get it under this, um, this uh, like a decision linear assumption, which is a better assumption than all the ones we worked with. And actually, I say you know, my, my student Allison has been looking at uh, you know, automating this. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's best not to have to do it. You, you like a quick way to do it. Um, but in the past, all these things have been translated over. Um, so if, if you name me any composite order scheme, Mike, I can tell you um, it's been translated or I think I can tell you it's been translated or ha has been translated over. Does the same thing for a version? Like if I give you a prime assumption, which is really complex or static, and composite order group is the prime So, so if, if it's static, uh, we're going a little, let, let me just, let me get back to that, like um, we're getting a little on a tangent here, but maybe, um, uh, maybe that's best offline. Okay, so I just want to give you a little overview of um, how, how the proof um, goes. Um, so so the, the challenges here are that if we want to do a partition, what was called a partitioning type proof, um, these things, they always relied on you if I had like um, the challenge ciphertext of a vector of length 10, I had to program in these 10 levels of the identity into the public parameters. Well, or 15 or whatever. And now my public parameters are only of size 5 or some small constant. So these partitioning proofs don't look like they'll, they'll work here. So that's a problem. But even with um, dual system proofs, this, it's this kind of low entropy. They kind of depend on what I'll call entropy to avoid some, some paradox. And they kind of always depended on the parameters being pretty big. So um, it wasn't even obvious how to do it with these, um, these proofs. Uh, but it turned out we were able to do this with dual system encryption. Um, and let's see, I'm almost, <coughs> let's see, so, so I'll, I'll give a quick overview of dual system encryption and, uh, but maybe in, in the talk there and people can uh, ask, ask me questions um, offline. Okay, so um, actually, you know, I'll, I'll just skip a couple of these slides here because I uh, probably don't have, sorry, this, this whiteboard thing, I didn't know how long it would take. Um, so if you're interested in dual system encryption, um, uh, you can talk to me. Um, offline, but so let me just conclude by saying, okay, so we did have this original motivation um, for hierarchical IBE, um, but okay, we can maybe argue this point a little bit. You might be able to say like, well, geez, what if you just made them of, of depth 30? No, no, maybe people won't go depth below 30. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's actually true or not. Uh, where I think it gets much more motivating is um, in attribute-based encryption where, for example, the ciphertext is pegged with some metadata like um, um, attributes. And a user's key is which, you know, which describing which ciphertext it's allowed to decrypt. So in the past, um, what I've had to do is um, the public parameters would give a bound of how many attributes would describe something. And um, there, it's a little hard to say, well, what should this bound be? You know, you could have some time variable. You might come up with, you know, there could be some very short, some with, you know, very short ones, and then. You know, maybe every once in a while there's a few that grow to a few hundred. Well, now everyone needs to pay the price um, for this. Moreover, to like, compute these hash functions, um, actually, if, if, if you make your public parameters of size n, it's actually um, n squared. You need n exponentiations for computing this hash function each time. So it actually, um, the performance really hurts you um, uh, much more than even in the HIB case. OK, so let's. Um, so, so this is kind of the more motivating thing to me. And I'll just say um, we were able to extend this to attribute-based encryption. A lot of the kind of main, it, 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 it follows pretty, it, it follows reasonably easily. So before this HIB, you know, we split up this um, alpha into the secret lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 plus lambda j is equal to alpha. 
Here, here we mainly just, um, if we have a Boolean formula or like a secret sharing scheme associated with the policy, we just reflect that secret sharing um, um, over there. Okay, and it turns out kind of the weird thing is even though we do dual system encryption proofs, which is supposed to be good for adaptive security, um, we were only able to get selective in this case um, for a reason I can. So in the HIB, we were able to get adaptive security. Um, we had to sort of go back to selective security for the attribute-based encryption world, which was um, a little funny in some ways, uh, but uh, um, uh, for, for a technical reason. But um, anyway, so th th this is where I think like, kind of where the motivation really helps out because I just have pretty much the same size, very small parameters. And you know, I, uh, like kind of when I publish my system, I don't have to commit myself to how many attributes I, I need. Is that technical reason something that's worth talking about, or is it just kind of very specific? Um, we, would need to understand, we would need to go deeper into the proof in order to explain the technical. So I'm happy to talk about it offline, it, probably the amount of time we can to it. Um, OK, so any questions? Well, <coughs> okay. <coughs> you didn't get what I meant. Okay, well, so, so this ciphertext is pegged with um, two attributes, right? So what's the maximum number of attributes you can, you can tag to a ciphertext? Uh, well, so I'll, I'll reference um, the Goyal Pandy, Sahai, it says the, the Pandy paper. Um, so if, if you want to, um, if you have public parameters of size four or something, can you tag in 20 attributes in, in your work? Yeah, it, it's the same spanning problem as we, remember we had this like kind of weird hash function and, um, and, and that was a very slow, slow hash function. You didn't get only a small universe, you get Yeah, much. yeah, but even the small, yeah, the small universe, the public parameters are exactly equal to the number of attributes. So um, yeah, so so it's in it's in your own work that the limitation is is present. So so it wasn't totally clear to me in uh -huh. your solution. So you had this secret secret sharing technique, uh -huh. um, and then that also increased the size of the public parameters, right? Because you were you had sub i, and the number of uh, i's was the number of shares of the secret, right? So that wasn't the size of the public parameters. Sh should I go back to the slide? Yeah, that would yeah. be great. And okay. My basic question is whether, like, what was the purpose of the secret sharing? Was that what was giving you the unbounded, that you could get it, you could keep going level after level, and you just need to increase the number of shares in the secret? Or what um, was giving you the unbounded? Okay, so let's bring up the system. So, so, so maybe I'll... I'll so uh, and what is J? Um, so, so J is the level, but notice the public oh, parameters so are here. The, they're they're oh, constant. Sorry, not the public parameters, the ciphertext size. Um, yeah, it does, that, that, that does go at the level. Yes. So, so, which is the same as previous systems. So J can go to infinity and then J can go to infinity. Size goes to infinity. Yeah, so, so, so the ciphertext size does grow with, with the number of. <clears throat> I mean, you, uh, so one question is can you do this with a compact ciphertext? But so this kind of matches what was what, what was done with previous like in the in the Bonnet Boyan system for example um, the ciphertext size grew with the with the um, with the number of levels. It's just I can pick any when I'm encrypting I can pick any J I want, right? Uh, the public parameters don't. There's nothing in the public parameters that dictates me to me how far I need to go. It is the case that it does grow linearly with J, but there's nothing in the public parameters which <coughs> specifies like maximum J. So is the role of this, so if alpha is the sum of these things, so that must have come out somewhere in the proof that you showed us, like the calculation that you could cancel things, or not the proof, but the, the correctness of um, decryption or whatever. That, that you mean this, this part here? Yeah, I'm, I'm tr having trouble understanding the mapping of the <coughs> secret sharing scheme to the what you showed us. I didn't quite follow the details. Like, sure. Are these supposed to be like independent secrets that are given at each level? Like if you're the person that's delegated DAO and J levels, mm -hmm. you're going to get all of these guys? Or? Well, you, you'll get them in the exponent over here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I mean, if I gave them to you in the clear, you could break the scheme. Um, so... So, so here, here's, uh, so for, let me first say, uh, you had this other question. Yeah, I didn't, so I kind of took Allison's slides and, and modified them a little bit. 
Uh, I, the secret sharing part is, isn't the, really the not. The, the secret sharing was kind of done before in the previous systems, more or less, uh, or in other things. It's kind of more this, I mean, it's part of it, but it's kind of more this structure of the ciphertext, which is more the novelty and this local cancellation. Um, but, <coughs> so, okay, so, so, so I'm making a key for you, right? I'm, I'm going to make um, a key of, let's say you're at depth five, okay? So, um, okay, so the authority, what it does is it chooses lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, lambda four, all the way to lambda fives, such that they sum to alpha. And I just, and I, I give you the key of this according to this algorithm. And you give me the alpha. No, I don't give you alpha. That's the master secret key. Oh. I, I don't, I, yeah. So I shouldn't give you alpha. Um, okay. And, and you get, you only, I don't even give you the lambdas. I just give you them. Bothering me is, is that it seems weird that like normally keys you think of them as being random and here you've got them they're related right I mean they're you took like say in one instance would be like lambda five would be one more than lambda five in another instance and lambda four was one less than lambda four in the other instance that, 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 they still add to the same thing okay no but here's how I do it I choose lambda one randomly I lose choose ram, lambda two randomly lambda three four randomly and then I set lambda five to yeah, be so al alpha minus random. Yeah, they're not completely random, um, but but if, if they were completely random, anyone could make a private key. Like they have to tie together somehow. You, you want decryption. You want these things to like relate. If they don't relate to alpha in any way, you know, they're like completely random group elements. Then. Um, <coughs> yeah. Thinking about the security issue, it seems there's something that seems. A little weird. Well, I mean, and um, also don't know in what so is it secret sharing in the sense that like when you just <coughs> do that decryption calculation, that it, it looks like it's the secret sharing thing, or what? Why do you call it secret sharing? Um, it, it's like an n out of n secret sharing. So pretty much, so in, in the HIB, I'm saying you have to match at level one. You have to, and you have to match at level two, and you have to match at level three, and level four, and level five. So basically, I'm taking the secret as part of the I'm basically executing, uh, I'm sharing the secret alpha into these exponents and then I'm embedding them. In the AB system, if I have some policy of like, you know, attribute A or B and C, I'll, I'll share it, I'll do secret. Pretty much the, I mean, the attribute based encryption system is just really the same thing except for where you share alpha like according to some, some, pol some linear secret sharing scheme that represents a policy. Um, but I'll just remark that um, this idea that alpha is embed, like in all these previous systems, like the Bonnet Boyne, when alpha is embedded in the key. So, so, so at no point do you have private keys which are completely random, right? Like, I mean, if we, if we lifted up the screen again, we'll, we would see the Bonnet Boyne system has alpha embedded in it. Um, so so I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say the fact that alpha is embedded somewhere in here is, is, is a strange thing. Um, yeah, you have to make the security proof go through, but um, if it wasn't embedded in there, I'd be scared because they're like, when the heck is Alpha doing? You know, like these things should all be reflected. Uh, I guess Carl than Leo? Sorry, you guys are tied. Well, this is a much less technical question. Okay. So you've been using these um, examples like with Kristen and doing the key, the, the, the delegation chain. Um, and so. It's been something of a disappointment with public key infrastructure. The delegation changes are typically not very long. Yeah. And part of the reason for that is that if you go down through all the registration authority kinds of things you would need to do a long depth of chain, mm -hmm. basically when you go climbing back up the chain to another place, the trust relationship would be very weak. And, mm -hmm. and so that uh, having a depth of chain of more than 20, it's hard to imagine that anyone anywhere else in the tree would trust something at that low level with sure. all those registrations intervening. And so having a, a very great depth of tree is not very likely if that's the type of example. I just wanted to understand if I could reconcile that with uh, what you were saying about the, uh, the need to have attributes. So having 100 attributes is not at all implausible. That's, that's pretty, you know, yeah. could very well happen. And so could you help me understand a little better this relationship between the depth of the tree and the size of the features that you're working with? Um, so, so I think during the middle of my talk, I did say, like, well, I think the mot for reasons similar to what you're giving here, I said the motivation is stronger in ABE. Yeah, so um, I understand. So what is that? 
to this depth of tree as far as like multiple delegations. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, actually, um, can I grab some whiteboard? I mean, in, in, in some sense, um, this HIB, it's almost like an and. Yeah. Sorry, Josh. I didn't mean to. This is almost like an and policy. It's like you meet you you match at level one. It's like you match at level one and level two and level three. If, forget about the delegation for a second. It's almost like you have to match at level one and level two and level three and level four and level five. Just one big. So what ABE is, it, OK, so that's just and policies. So ABE is just sort of like, well, we, we have better than and. We have any Boolean formula. So it's, it just turned, so it's kind of like how, yeah, it's how many different attributes. So how many different, so when you're in, in the ciphertext, you, 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 for HIB, you, you kind of give, something out for each different level, and an attribute-based encryption give out something for each different attribute. Um, the techniques are very similar. Okay. I, I use HIB because it's, it's, it's a simpler thing for pedagogical reasons to give in the talk, but when, once you understand the HIB thing, getting the attribute-based encryption is like a very small step. So, so is this relating the depth of delegation from HIB to the, to the depth of the policy that you would have? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah no, that, it's a little, yeah, there's a little bit of a, that's maybe a little bit of a false connection. It, it's like, um, it's like for, it turns out I have to give like a component of the site. In HIB, I have to give a component. We're just kind of counting components of the ciphertext. So for each level in HIB, I happen to give out, have to give out something. For each component of the ciphertext, I have to give out something. And then for an attribute-based encryption, for each kind of attribute I have, I have to give out a component of the ciphertext. So um, it, it turns, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah so, so yeah, I, I, could, I could see how you might, oh, depth of HI, yeah, there's this kind of, you know, maybe that, that leaves you a little bit in the false. Leo? So I had a related question with attribute-based encryption. What, what Boolean formulas do you support, and what does it cost to support uh, esoteric formulas? Which, which Boolean formulas do we yeah, support? Yeah, have like a very deep nested Boolean formula. Um, and, 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 and any Boolean formula. And the cost sort of uh, this, this, the, 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 okay, so, so um, there's kind of two different versions of ABM. I'm fo let's focus on the key policy one. Um, basically, the so think of the number of nodes leaves in the Boolean formula, mm -hmm. um, the, or the, the size of the Boolean formula. There's like a group element or two group, whatever, a couple group elements for every in, in the private key. For, 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 for this, sorry, the size of the private key grows linearly with the size of the Boolean formula. In whatever form you write it, or in a specific, like in the CNF? Um, in whatever form you write it. Okay. So if, if you can find a good representation, then it's nice. it's good. If you find if you find a really bad representation, it's okay. equally bad. Yeah. And, and that's um, pretty much the same in all these AB systems. Anything else? All right. So let's take okay. Thanks.